folks. Welcome back. Okay, so we've gone through the stature age and um, sex estimations. We've talked about ancestry. Now we're going to talk about one last thing that really comes into play when trying to determine the identity of a decedent. And that is something that we call non-metric traits. Fundamentally, what that means is traits that are either there or they're not. They're not measurable necessarily. There isn't more or less of any of these. They're either there or they're not. So non-metric traits are non-measurable skeletal features that are usually naturally occurring and are classified by presence or absence. So that means that if there is one of these traits, they can help us determine who that individual was if they happen to have one. The downside of these is for the most part, the person wouldn't necessarily know that they have them. A lot of these are hidden within the body. The only way they'll show up is in a high quality CT scan or a really high definition um, radiograph like an x-ray but more often than not they're fairly unique however if we can match them with a, a radiograph or um, any other thing that somebody might have known then we can narrow it down we've talked about some of these but we'll go into more detail okay the most common of the non-metric traits are things called hype, uh, auditory hyperostoses. Whenever you see the word ostoses, that means it's, it's a growth. It's a growth of bone. Ost means bone, like osteometry. Hyper means over. So there's this overgrowth of bone. The auditory hyperostoses happen in, not surprisingly, the ear. That's the, the auditory. They can be, there's some speculation that they can be caused by deep sea diving in cold water, things like that. We're not sure, um, but it's just a little growth in the ear canal uh, of bone, and the person may or may not know they have it. A persistent metopic suture, which is a suture line that goes between the two eyes. Um, this is something all people are born with, but some people retain that. It's also called a retained metopic suture throughout life. So persistent or retained metopic suture. Olecranon apertures, those are in the elbows, and we'll show you what those look like. It's an opening in the elbow, um, may be associated with hyperextension of the elbow. Third molar agenesis, that means you don't get your wisdom teeth. Supernumerary bones, these are very, very common. These include little bones that are actually called sesamoid bones because they're so tiny. These happen in areas of high usage. So if you are using your hands for kneading or working your hands a lot, you tend to get these little tiny bones in the tendons of your hand. You can get them all over your body. A vastus notch, eh, we may or may not go into this. This is something found in the kneecap. Shovel-shaped incisors, which we've gone over before. There are a lot of these. There's over 400. In fact, by now, there's probably well over six or 800. Usually, non-metric traits have absolutely no negative effects. The person would usually go through life unnoticed uh, that they have these traits. If they are a noticeable trait, like the shovel-shaped incisors, even then, unless they're taught about these things, they won't necessarily know they have them. Uh, third molar agenesis, people would obviously know because they didn't have to have wisdom teeth extracted. Um, they may know that they have extra bones here and there sometimes, little things like that, but a lot of them, the vast majority, virtually unnoticeable. Okay, here's one what we've seen before also. These are called wormian or Inca bones. What we're looking at here are extra bones that form within the suture. Here's one's actually fallen out, but here these are really busy sutures, and when these and we recognize the really busy sutures go with which ancestral traits? I'm not gonna answer that. I'll let you go back into the last video and see it if you haven't. Uh, the rest of it is what we have here, these little extra bones, which back in the mid 19th century, they thought these looked like worms. So they're called wormian bones. If you get a very large one, specifically at the juncture between the lambdoidal suture, which is this shaped here, 
and the sagittal suture, which is this one here, right in this area, if you get a large bone, we will sometimes call those an Inca bone, which, as I mentioned in the last video, is highly associated with Asiatic skulls and, moreover, uh, Native American skulls. Massive Wormian bones, also known as Inca bones, but these are up at a different part of the skull. This is up in the Bregma area. This is where the, the coronal suture meets with the sagittal suture. Again, you can see these very busy suture lines that eventually split and actually bones form within them. Very common. Here is a typical Inca bone down here at the lambdoidal suture. The persistent or retained metopic suture. What we're looking at here is this suture that goes right up the middle of the, of the forehead. Again, doesn't cause anything. It's not like their, their, head, their forehead is weaker than somebody who doesn't have the retained metopic suture. Usually, we're all born with these sutures to allow the head to squeeze through the birth canal. Usually, those sutures will obliterate. Uh, the metopic suture almost always obliterates by about the age of 10. However, some people per retain these throughout life. They'll have them up until they're 80 or 90 years old. Pretty rare, but it happens. It's not all that uncommon. It's about 10%. Parietal foramina. A foramina, the word foramen, means a hole in bone. Foramina is plural. So parietal foramina, these are holes in the parietals. These are extremely common. Parietal foramina can actually grow very large. They can be a big old hole like this. Don't worry, you can't stab your brain. All it is is an opening in the, in the skull. Oftentimes there are blood vessels or things going through it. But it is if you have a larger one, it will be filled in with connective tissue. It's very tough stuff. This is a close-up of a parietal foramen. Um, you can see a single one on this side. There's a tiny one on this side, but for the most part, it's all on this side. This would be the sagittal suture coming down the middle here. Okay. Vastus notch. These are these notches found, as I mentioned, in the kneecap. It's just a little notch right here in the top inner side of the kneecap. This is the, down, this is the side that points down toward the foot. This is the part that points up toward the, toward the head, I guess. And right here, there's a little notch. These are fairly common as well. You may even be able to feel one on your own kneecap. The shovel-shaped incisors, we've gone over these before. These are these unique ridges on either side of the incisor teeth. Usually shows up most prominently in the upper incisors, but can also show up in the lower, the mandibular incisors. These are these ridges on either side of the tooth. Very, very common amongst Asiatic groups. This is the olecranon aperture. Nobody ever calls it a septal aperture. Olecranon, uh, the olecranon process is that elbow bone you feel on the edge of your bone, on, on, the, ed on the end of your elbow. And it kind of slots into the back side of your upper arm bone called the humerus. This is right in the humerus. You can see there's an opening here. It hasn't been broken. Sometimes they're very large. They can be maybe the size of a dime even. But this is a very tiny one. This would be about the size of maybe, I don't know, an eighth of an inch or less, sixteenth of an inch. Uh, this would be about three millimeters. Um, the aperture just means there is a connection between the two. Normally, there is a very, very thin sheet of bone here, which can get broken. Uh, or it can be with the rounded edges. You can see that it's been during life that they had this. The olecranon aperture, here's a very large one that shows up in an x-ray. I don't know if you can see this, but it's this big opening. Here's the olecranon process of the ulna, the lower arm bone. This is the upper arm bone, the humerus. And this dark spot right here is a big opening in the olecranon uh, fossa, which is a, um, a depression on the back side of the humerus in the elbow. Supernumerary. Uh, we talked about supernumerary. That just means extra bones. Uh, ribs are very, very common to have extras of. They usually happen up in the cervical region in the neck, right near the transition between the cervical or neck vertebra and the thoracic vertebra, which are the vertebrae of the thorax, which are normally associated with the ribs. 
oftentimes we'll have an extra little rib growing in here. Now this can become an issue. Sometimes it can cause things like numbness or even pain if they affect nerves, but this is called a cervical rib, meaning it's in the neck. You can have supernumerary ribs down here as well in the normal thorax. You'll just have an extra rib here. Uh, that's fairly common. You can have extra ribs, fewer ribs, all kinds of weird things going on in the ribs, um, which are very common. If there are lower ribs in the thorax region, you'll probably never know you have it unless you get an x-ray. Supernumerary bones happening all over the place. Here are some in this individual's skull. This is an extra bone. It's grown in where the parietal, which is here, normally would go all the way across here, but here we have extra sutures. That's all they are. It's an extra suture, really, but we call it an extra bone because this bone technically should not exist. Here we can see this individual has a lot of them. They've got another uh, odd, odd shaped bone structure on the other side of their skull. So here we have odd shaped bone coming around here, odd shaped bone here. The parietals are truncated and not normal shaped. Then we have supernumerary bones within the sutures here. We would call these wormian bones. All right. Um, hyper, auditory hyperostoses. This is an auditory little bone, a little bone within the ear canal here, also called the auditory meatus. That's what the ear canal is technically called. And here we'll have this little growth of bone here. They can happen anywhere around this opening. Uh, as I mentioned, you may or may not notice it if you feel inside your ear canal and you feel a little bump, that may be an auditory uh, hyperostosis. There is some anecdotal literature that they form in deep diving in cold water. Not necessarily though, and there's a lot of speculation there. Okay, squatter's facet. Squatter's facets happen on the bottom of the tibia. That's your larger of the two lower leg bones. The other one is called the fibula. And it happens when somebody, uh, out of habit, like habitually, often meaning, tend to squat and they get a little extra facet, just like a facet in a diamond. It's a face, it's a flattened area because it's being used in this hyperextension. What you see here, you see this acute angle of the foot to the tibia, and this is what they actually look like. Here is your average ordinary tibia. You can see this is where it would meet up with the talus bone to form the ankle joint. You can see there's virtually nothing there. But here, we've got this little extra facet here. That is a typical squatter's facet. You can see it's almost an, an extension of this articular surface where it's nice and smooth because it's made for articulation in a joint. Well, that articulation bounces over the edge here and goes right there. That is from habitually squatting throughout this individual's life. This would be something we would consider to be a cultural adaptation. This is something that people do because they spend a lot of time squatting. A lot of places around the world spend an awful lot of time in a squatting position. So non-metric traits can tell us, number one, familial relationships. In other words, if somebody's parents have it, they'll often pass it on. They can show them occupation. This is something people do throughout the day. It's not to be confused with the way we use the term occupation, meaning a job. It literally means what they do all day. So for us as Westerners, our occupation literally would be considered sitting. If we were to look at our skeletons, the amount of time that people in the United States or really all of Western world sit on our butts, think about it. You wake up in the morning, you get up, you go sit down and eat breakfast. Then you get up, you're like, whoo, great breakfast, now I've gotta to go to work. You sit down in your car to go to work, then you get to work and you sit down, often unless you're a nurse or something, you sit down at a computer and work all day, and then you sit down to get home, sit down to eat dinner, and then whoo, I've had a rough day. I'm gonna sit down and watch TV. We sit all the time. You'll also notice this with gender roles and cultural habits. Gender roles can be something like, 
um, working, uh, for example, in some traditional societies, especially here in the American Southwest, what we call a matate elbow. That is, people who are grinding matate, grinding corn on a matate. It's kind of a manual grinding stone. And they will grind, sto uh, grind corn into corn meal or flour. That is typically a female role. So there we would see it as a gender role. And of course, cultural habits like what we saw with the squatters facet. By the way, the gender role that I just mentioned would be called a matate elbow. Crazy stuff, right? Anyway, short video. We'll get into a really exciting, fun one. At least I think so because I've got a pretty strong bias there in our next video. I'll see you guys then.